In this very special edition of Small Town Big Deal, we honor the courage, self-sacrifice, and devotion of every man and woman who has ever worn the uniform of our great nation. And we want to thank our partner, Bad Boy Mowers, for being the inaugural sponsor of this special and for honoring and paying tribute to all of those who have defended our country and our freedoms time and time again. And we want to thank you as we express a nation's gratitude in a salute to veterans. Bad Boy Mowers is proud to present a salute to veterans. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. And we are in Conneaut, Ohio, population about 12,000 people. Now, Conneaut sits along the shores of Lake Erie, but the beach here bears an uncanny resemblance to a renowned beach nearly 3,800 miles away. And that resemblance draws tens of thousands of people every year to Conneaut to reenact the largest naval invasion in the history of the world. They come to a 21st century town on the peaceful shores of Lake Erie to turn back the clock to a time when the whole world was at war. Standing around talking to Joe. Standing around talking to Joe. No particular place to go. No particular place to go. For one weekend each year, it is June 1944, and Conneaut, Ohio has been transformed into Normandy, France. Welcome to the largest annual D-Day reenactment in the United States. More than 1,500 reenactors take a break from their everyday lives to volunteer their time, energy, and expertise to make sure that the events of America's finest hour are kept alive. Where were we at? I was on Normandy Beach. Guests of honor include veterans who actually lived this history. Well, I was only 17 years old. I knew it, it, there's dang, dangers ahead, but I wasn't giving too much uh, thought about it. But. Andy Simkovich is one of the veterans attending this year's reenactment of D-Day. That's when Allied troops landed in Normandy, in German-occupied France, to begin to take back continental Europe from German forces. Back in 1944, Andy was a teenager in the U.S. Navy, one of over two million troops from more than a dozen countries gathered in Britain to prepare for D-Day. At Conneaut, both German and Allied encampments are meticulously recreated to the last detail. Okay, so I have to admit, when I see the German uniforms, there's a part of me that's like... <gasps> Gets a little nervous? Yeah. Hold it like this, see how I have it in my hand? From a chow line at the mess tent to saving lives at a field hospital. This is your morphine, check near the wound site, and um, it takes about 30 minutes, which compared to today is very long. Please clear the beach, we're going to be firing in 15 minutes. Clear the beach. But the centerpiece of D-Day Conneaut is the reenactment of Allied troops storming the beach. D-Day approaches and the ships are in their assigned positions. Getting all those men and the rations, weapons, vehicles, and supplies to the battlefield was a historic accomplishment in itself, involving almost 7,000 vessels, from battleships to landing craft. In Conneaut, vintage landing craft assemble on Lake Erie for reenactment weekend. Here we go. Spectators get a chance to board vintage Higgins boats and cruise Lake Erie. It's quite a ride. I'm trying to put myself in that frame of mind that those young men would have been in that day. The reenactors do their very best to help you imagine what it was like when the boats approached. And so the invasion begins. Fighters and bombers crisscross the sky. Up on the bluff, German troops are dug in and pour fire onto the Allies, trying to climb up onto the bluff overlooking the beach. And that's when it gets really loud. 
This is the German Flak 88, which was the most prolific artillery piece of the Second World War by the Axis powers. It was so advanced compared to what the rest of the world had. And it's clear that the thousands of people gathered to watch D-Day Conneaut appreciate all the effort that goes into this living history experience. That may be especially true for the veterans of the Second World War. Well, to me, it represents the strength of the country. Let the people that didn't know what happened in World War II get some idea of what our veterans and the people that survived it. Better in a history book. Agreed. Because it brings it to life. It brings it to life. It brings it to life, yeah. It certainly brings it to life for 91-year-old veteran Richard Ray Pylon. And all of a sudden, I got goosebumps. I took my helmet off. And I looked around and I, I just almost got scared because it was almost like I was in the middle of the battle. Thank you for your service. It was an immense honor to meet these veterans. And what really struck us was how modest they are. We wasn't heroes. We were just like having a job and we were laborers. Yeah. You was doing a job. But what a job they did, literally saving the world from tyranny. It seems right that all these decades later, thousands of people come to Ohio every year and work hard to reenact that turning point in world history. And for all those who have sacrificed, may we never forget. Up next. This is a time period where many people believed that people of color could not fly. Some very courageous World War II pilots who had to fight for the right to defend their country. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We are in Tuskegee, Alabama. At a place dedicated to a very special group of World War II <laughs> fighter pilots who were busy fighting two battles. Yeah, one overseas and the other right here at home. The Tuskegee Airmen were members of the very first squadron of African American pilots in the history of the U.S. Army Air Corps. This National Historic Site at Moulton Field in Tuskegee honors them. National Park Ranger Vester Marable is an expert on the Tuskegee Airmen and walks us through this critical piece of American history. The Tuskegee Airmen were the bombardiers, the navigators, the pilots, but they were also the grounds crew, the cooks, the mechanics. But in the early 1940s, they still battled segregation and prejudice in many parts of the U.S. They had to fight for the right to fight for America. This is a time period where many people believed that people of color could not fly. John Lee Spencer remembers what it was like to be fighting a war on two fronts. We were outsiders and we were trying to break the color barrier, get into the fight, and we wanted to prove ourselves that we were good enough to be one of them. We proved that you could be whatever you wanted to be or whatever our government would let you be. And if what you wanted to be was a military pilot, then it all started here in Tuskegee. Where we're standing right now is actually in front of what we call the J-3 Piper Cub. And this was one of the beginning trainer planes that the Tuskegee Airmen would have used. It's basically a stick and rudder aircraft, very basic. It gets you off the ground and lets you learn how to fly. And while there wasn't much support for the program, in the spring of 1941, the trainees had a very famous and very important visitor. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt visits and then flies with one of the flight instructors. She lands and utters some iconic words. Well, it looks like you can fly all right. And the rest is literally history. There were 13 candidates that originally started in July of 1941. At the end of the very rigorous program, five of them earned their wings. As the pilots developed, the planes got bigger and more powerful. Once you get to Tuskegee's Moulton Field, uh, you'd go from flying the J-3 Piper Cub up to the PT-17 Stearman. And now uh, this is your big baby. So you're That's going, a lot more powerful motor. It's got a lot more. The Continental engine, and uh, some were even made by Rolls-Royce, gives you that room that you would, that you would expect <laughs> to hear from what's those it, planes. What's that called? What is that? That room. Once you finish in Hangar 1, you get to Hangar 2, and you see the plane that brought them so many victories. This is our P-51 Mustang D. 
These planes were like supercharged compared to what they were flying with earlier, which would only go maybe 100 mile an hour, and these go over 400 miles an hour. That's right. The airmen became affectionately known as the Red Tails for the distinctive red paint applied to their P-51's tail. This was a symbolic piece that showed that their accomplishments were finally being rewarded and were given a chance to really prove what they could do. And prove themselves they did. Men of the 99th have a brilliant record. As can be seen in the documentary at the National Historic Site, the Red Tails flew over the skies of Europe, protecting the bombers with incredible results. In over 1,500 missions, the airmen shot down 112 enemy aircrafts. No more, no longer could that miss that the black man could not fly and fight. They can do extraordinary things. And this they did there on the beaches of Rio. Even after all of their victories abroad during the war, when they got home, the Tuskegee Airmen still had a long road ahead of them. So the double V here. The double V stands for double victory. It was a campaign that began in 1942 to promote the fight for freedom and democracy both overseas and on the home front. Even though it was segregated, we were still Americans and we had a land to fight for just like anybody else. The contributions made by the Tuskegee Airmen was an important step in the long march for equality and civil rights that would follow. Tuskegee Airmen came home and became involved in the struggle at home. And as a result, they changed the condition at home. May the accomplishments of these brave heroes continue to inspire, and may their spirit always soar. Coming up next on Small Town Big Deal. You don't come out here, but what, you don't see someone that's got a story to tell. How one man's promise and devotion is providing a remarkable place of healing and reflection for veterans near and far. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. The Vietnam War claimed the lives of 58,318 service members and wounded an estimated 153,000. Surviving soldiers returned home to a growing number of Americans opposed to the war. For many, it would take decades before they heard the words, thank you for your service. Jim Edelman was only 19 years old when he fought in the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. He served his country with honor. But his dedication and sacrifice didn't end on the battlefield. After leaving Vietnam, he often thought of a promise he made during the war. I made a promise that if I made it back to the United States alive, I had to do something to honor and show my respect to my comrades. It was a promise that for years he longed to fulfill. After returning to his small town of Missouri, Jim married Charlene and got a job as a butcher. Jim worked tirelessly. He and Charlene saved religiously, and he consistently invested for over 50 years, sometimes just a few dollars at a time. Then the time came when he was finally able to fulfill that promise to never forget, and Missouri's National Veterans Memorial was born. The memorial includes a replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., exact in every aspect. The wall is even positioned toward the sun at the precise degree and angle as the original. To launch the project, Jim donated 47 acres of land that had been in his family for three generations. But that wasn't all. After all those years of investing a part of his paychecks working as a small town butcher, Jim was able to get the construction well underway by gifting his life savings, two and a half million dollars. I never dreamed of this being, you know, what it turned out to be. Before we ever started building, I said, if we're gonna build something, it's gonna have to be the best of the best because that's all our veterans deserve, the best. And that's what we've done. Jim's dream that a national memorial that provides a lasting tribute to our nation's veterans is coming true. I sit right in front of my brother and I get a lot of people that come up and pat me on the back, say thank you. 
said, you don't thank me. I'm just a devoted brother. You thank him, because these are all heroes, every one. Charlie Higgins comes to the memorial every week to honor his brother, Herschel, who was killed in Vietnam at just 20 years of age. Charlie's been making these weekly visits since the first day construction began on the memorial. Charlie was there along with many others to sign the back of the wall before the reverse side was applied. It's filled with thoughts, prayers, and photographs, another way to pay tribute to those whose names appear on the other side. Words that are now hidden, but feelings that are still quite visible. Perryville, Missouri, with a population of just over 8,000, is about an hour and a half south of St. Louis. There's so much more advantages to have a, a, a memorial like this, located in an environment like this. It's just much more comforting, it's just much more meaningful. It, it lends itself to the emotion that everybody has when they, when they come here. For me, it's something that I can be proud of. Like, I've always loved my hometown. When I tell people about this town, this is just another thing that I can tell them that we have that nowhere else does. And the memorial is meant for veterans of all wars and conflicts, not just Vietnam, providing a place for personal reflection or an opportunity to share memories with others. For veterans here, myself, this is, a, this is healing. I meet a lot of people here and I tell this is where, where the good people meet. I've heard more thank yous for your service right here in the last, uh, well, almost a year now, I guess, than I did in the last 48 years. Wow. The memorial can be emotionally overwhelming, and so can getting to know Jim and seeing firsthand his devotion. I tell you, Jim, I, I gotta shake your hand. Well. I may not be able to say this, but I'm not sure I have met anybody. And I, my hope is that the show can inspire others to do uh -huh. what you've done. A lot of people say, no, this is not the Vietnam Wall. It's the healing wall, or it's America's wall. There's still work to be done to complete Jim's vision for the memorial the building of a veterans hall, an interfaith chapel, a cemetery, and a reflecting fountain. These are all projects that require donations from supporters. Let's help Jim and his crew finish this amazing tribute to all those who've served and continue to serve our great nation today. We'd love for you, our viewers, to contribute to Missouri's National Veterans Memorial. And to all our veterans from Jan and me and our whole team at Small Town Big Deal, Thank you for your service. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We hope you've enjoyed this special Small Town Big Deal salute to veterans. And we want to once again thank our partner, Bad Boy Mowers for being the inaugural sponsor of this special and giving us all the chance to remember and honor the courageous veterans of our great nation. From D-Day on Lake Erie. To the Tuskegee Airmen. To Jim Edelman's extraordinary mission to honor his fallen brothers, all examples of bravery and sacrifice. May we always be a grateful nation. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. Now, are you going to the dance tonight? Yeah, right. we'll probably be there. We can't dance with anybody under 90. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it! I love it! Well, I personally want to thank you for your service. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Rodney's going to shake thank your hand. Thank you so much. And I'm going to give you a hug. All right. I'll accept it. <laughs>